So far, in all our conversations, there's been one main theme, and that is that the volatility of past returns on their own are simply insufficient in adequately approximating the value at risk of any trading strategy. We gave you an example in a previous tutorial where um, there was this very nice looking um, curve for a trading strategy's track record exhibiting very low volatility up to a certain point. And we talked about how an investor, were, they, were the investor looking to invest in such a trading strategy, would have been misled uh, were the investor considering just the volatilities of past returns because what happened after in one single trade gave rise to the need to study the risk assumed by a trader in arriving at those returns to begin with, without which the investor would have no clue, would have had no clue that such an outcome was even possible for something that on the surface of things looked like this. The conversation then continued um, into calculating the, well, measuring the risk of a trading decision. And that brought in certain additional concepts such as leverage, the volatility of the instruments being traded, positions, what are positions compared to trading sequences, how are positions composed, what happens, uh, what do we need to consider in terms of calculating the risk of a position that has more than one asset. All of those things, all of those complications in arriving at adequate risk assessments for one single position led us to engineer the leverage whereby we could calculate the volatility of a position, a multi-asset position, one or more assets, and normalize it with the volatility of our reference asset, the euro dollar, over the last one year worth of euro dollar data to arrive at a, a singular universal value that measures the risk of any trading decision, a risk, the risk of a position, and tells us that, well, the risk of this position is x times as much as the risk of a sing similar trade on the euro dollar. For example, if the deleverage of a particular position is 10 to 1, it is the equivalent of saying, it, the equivalent of taking a 10 to 1 leveraged trade on the euro dollar. The ultimate objective behind calculating deleverage was to allow us to more conveniently measure the risk of any trading decision, uh, but um, just as importantly, to more adequately approximate the true value, a more, uh, a more realistic value at risk figure for any given trading strategy, as opposed to the value at risk that we would arrive at were we to use just the volatilities of past returns. Having said all of this, before we continue any further in this tutorial, it's important that if you haven't followed um, in sequence the tutorials up until this point in time that you do so prior to continuing in this tutorial because from here on each tutorial will assume that you're already familiar with the concepts and that you have an understanding of what we're talking about in terms of certain terminology so, such as deleverage etc etc. So if you haven't, pause this video, go back and watch them, come back, continue peacefully. Right. In today's tutorial, we want to talk about how leverage is replicated in a Darwin asset on behalf of investors, specifically in cases where the underlying strategy uh, is operating with too high a value at risk or a value at risk that is higher than a certain level. And in order to understand the context behind this conversation, we need to revisit certain concepts that we covered before we covered all of this, which was in tutorial two, where we talked about parametric value at risk calculations. Therein, we said that certain assumptions are made in parametric value at risk calculations when, uh, where were you to have a large enough sample of data where lots of market conditions have gone through it and lots of market regime changes have happened, lots of risk taking behavior on the part of the trader has been captured by this long track record. Um, under the parametric value at risk uh, measurement, you can model the returns using some distribution. In that case, we talked about the normal distribution and then arrive at a value at risk figure based on that model. What happens, however, in practice is that were you to calculate value at risk at 95% confidence using the parametric method methodology, you could possibly exceed a certain bound that must be respected when considering when calculating value at risk. And that is that at any given point in time, you cannot lose more than 100% of what you have. You cannot have a value at risk that is more than 100% of your available equity. So there is a constraint that we need to consider when modeling value at risk. However, this constraint can easily be disobeyed when modeling a value at risk at 95% confidence over a monthly horizon using the parametric value at risk. And this can create a complication for us uh, that we need to understand prior to going forwards in this tutorial and making sense of how leverage replication actually works given that this scenario exists.
So to better understand what we're talking about here, let's rub a few things off the board and draft a little table of a certain data that we will calculate value at risk at 95% confidence over monthly horizons using both methodologies. The parametric value at risk methodology that we talked about in tutorial two and the Darwin X value at risk uh, calculation methodology that we talked about in the most recent two tutorials on how we calculate value at risk at Darwin X. So in this table, we'll have some scenarios. And the scenarios are as such. Let's say this is scenario one, two, three, and four. In the second column, we'll have lot size. And that will enable us to vary the leverage on each of these, these scenarios, these simulations. In the next column, we'll calculate value at risk using the parametric method, using just the volatilities of daily returns. And here, we'll calculate the value at risk, 95% confidence. In, all ca in both cases, it's the horizon is monthly, so uh, monthly value at risk, using the Darwin X logic. And in the very first instance, uh, we'll, we'll set 0 0.01 lots or one micro lot on the simulation. And for a trading strategy that say has a starting capital of 10,000 US dollars and has a frequency of let's say 20 trades per month, where to keep this example simple, we're going to assume that the deleverage of each of these trades is fixed, which is impossible in practice, but we're going to keep this uh, example hypothetical and keep things simple for that nature, for that reason. And the duration as well of each of these trades is also fixed, let's say at one hour. Calculating value at risk parametrically under the normal distribution assumption and then calculating value at risk at Darwin X will lead to deferring outcomes as we go. It's important to understand how the evolution happens of these deferring outcomes. In the first instance, we have a lot size of 0 0.01 or micro lot. And say we were to calculate the value at risk, which if you remember, is the volatility of daily returns scaled by a factor of square root of 21 times 1.65. That is how we showed value at risk at 95% confidence, monthly value at risk calculated in tutorial two. Using this methodology over here, let's say we arrive at 0.1% value at risk, you'll find that the value at risk calculated at Darwin X would be more or less the same. Let's increment our lots from 0.01 to one mini lot or 0.1 lots. In this case, calculating value at risk parametrically in this manner would lead to a linear increase in um, the value at risk at 95% confidence calculated over the monthly horizon. By multiplying our lot size, by, by increasing our leverage 10 times, by multiplying by 10 in this case, would probably lead to a 1% value at risk. And in the case of Darwin X, you'd also find that that value at risk comes out to 1%. Let's skip over a few lot sizes. Let's scale our lots even further. Let's go to 100 lots for this last scenario. In this case, you'll find that the value at risk calculated, when you have a starting capital of 10,000, you're opening a 100 lot um, trade, probably going to reach something very large, like 1,000%. Whereas in the case of Darwin X, you'll reach a value that respects the constraint we talked about earlier that in any, at any given point in time, you cannot lose more than 100% of your available equity. So what we're trying to illustrate here is that if you were to plot a chart of the value at risk calculated at Darwin X, how we calculated at Darwin X on the Y axis, and the parametric bar, let's call it P bar, on the x-axis, the value at risk as calculated at Darwin X would always have an upper ceiling of 100%, meaning you can never lose more than 100% of your available equity. 
you'd also find that up until certain values at risk, such as 30%, you'd see a near linear relationship between the value at risk calculated parametrically using volatilities of past returns under the normal distribution assumption and the value at risk calculated using the Darwin X methodology. However, past this point of 30% value at risk, you'd see a decay effect manifest itself whereby all future increments in value at risk on the Darwin X scale would see a proportionately decayed effect on the parametric scale. Meaning that each time the value at risk increments, let's say, for example, say, we have 90% here and 80% here. And they correspond to these locations. Let's say that parametric value at risk here is X. In the case of Excuse the inability to draw straight lines or axis compliant curves in real time on video. That can be a challenge. <laughs> so that's 100%. Somewhere here we have 90%. What we're trying to illustrate is that for each incremental increase in value at risk calculated at Darwin X, there's a disproportionate or near exponential increase in the parametric value at risk calculated using leveraged returns. How does this impact our initial conversation of, well, how is leverage replicated on behalf of investors in a Darwin asset when the underlying strategy is operating with too high a value at risk or a value at risk that is beyond a certain level? It is this level that we were alluding to in our earlier conversation. The moral of this story, the reason to, to draft the values at risk calculated parametrically versus the values at risk calculated using our methodology at Darwin X, is that this effect tends to lead to a non-linear replication of leverage on behalf of investors when the underlying strategy is operating with too high um, a, val a value at risk or operating beyond 30% value at risk. What you'll find, let's take, uh, to, to understand this example a bit better, we know that a Darwin asset operates with a fixed value at risk 95% confidence monthly target of 10%. In the case where, let's say, an underlying strategy is operating at a value at risk of 50%, the risk manager will not replicate a near linear um, uh, differential based on these deferring values at risk. The replication of leverage on behalf of the investor will not be one over five, given what we know about how values at risk calculated using the Darwin X methodology scale in relation to values at risk calculated using just um, leveraged volatilities. In this case, given that the decay effect exists, to replicate leverage correctly for an investor where the underlying strategy is operating with too high parametric value at risk or value at risk as calculated by at Darwin X, you'll find that the replication of leverage is more to the tune of 1 over 7 or perhaps even lower, 1 over 9, something to that effect, as opposed to a near linear um, replication in, the, in 1 to 5. So, the important thing to absorb here is that parametric value at risk calculated on leveraged returns can exceed the bound of 100%, which cannot be exceeded in practice since you cannot exceed more than 100% of your available equity in terms of risk. Secondly, when calculating value at risk, you have to make sure that that boundary is respected. And given that this behavior exists between parametric value at risk assessment and Darwin X value at risk assessment, incremental changes beyond a certain point exhibit this exponential or decay effect that needs to be accounted for when we are replicating leverage on behalf of investors in a Darwin asset. Therefore, when the underlying strategy is operating with too high a value at risk, and we know that the Darwin asset operates at a fixed 10% value at risk, there is a non-linear replication that uh, takes place. In the case of this example, 10 over 50 would not be the correct 
replication of leverage given the behavior that we understand. It would be lower a number, 1 over 7 or 1 over 9, not exact numbers, but to illustrate the idea on how this works. Hopefully this has been explanatory. There's been a lot of material that's been covered in this tutorial, but the takeaway here is that leveraged volatilities affect parametric value at risk calculations in a way that can exceed um, practical boundaries. Those practical boundaries exhibit variation behavior that is uh, that exhibits this decay effect compared to parametric bar calculations. Based on this decay effect, leverage replicated on behalf of investors can therefore not be linear either. It has to follow a nonlinear pattern. The higher the leverage of the underlying strategy, the lower will be the replication on part on the part of the investor as a result of this behavior. In the next tutorial, we'll talk about the distribution of potential returns as a function of value, the value at risk of a trading strategy. And after that, we'll be dedicating uh, videos to an entire segment purely on how the Darwin X Risk Manager works. See you in the next tutorial.